I hope I can talk. I, I think it may be post-nasal drip or something, but my voice is pretty <clears throat> poor. Okay, today is the 25th of March, 2009. We are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. And sir, for the record, would you please state your full name, your date and place of birth? Donald H. Black, known to my friends as Don. Uh, I was born September 27, 1922 in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, did you attend school in Brooklyn? No, uh, I was raised in Rockville Center on Long Island and graduated from high school there. What year did you graduate? 1941. All right. Do you recall uh, where you were when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor and what your reactions were? Yes, I do. I was listening to my radio in my room uh, on a, a program that uh, ran between 3 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And somewhere during that period of time, the announcement was made. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. Okay. And uh, willingly, however. All right. And whereabouts were you processed in? I was um, inducted at uh, the Grand Central Palace, no longer exists in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And um, we were given a week's, that was January 12th, 1943. Mm -hmm. And we were given a week's leave to settle up our civilian affairs. and. Um, the reception center was in Camp Upton on Long Island. We were there uh, about four days. Um, we uh, were issued our uniforms and uh, given our branch assignments. Mm -hmm. they, they went to various branches of the Army. And I was selected for the Air Force. D did you request the Air Force or no. it was just the luck of the draw? Yeah, just, just selected. Okay. Uh, hey. I don't know whether it, at the induction center in uh, Grand Central Palace, um, we were given uh, the Gen Army General Classification Test. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to some extent uh, the scores on those tests um, contributed to their decision as to which branch you went in. All right. And uh, where were you sent next? Um, after about four days at Camp Upton, we were loaded on board a train. Of course, all the trains in those days were steam trains. We didn't mm -hmm. have diesels yet. And it was about a four-day trip, a long trip. They didn't tell us where we were going, but we watched the signs on the railroad stations. And uh, we knew we were going south, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, and eventually wound up at Miami Beach for basic training. Now, was that your first time away from home? Yes except for one month when I was 12 years old, I went to camp. <laughs> but yes, for any extended period of time, that was the first time. And you attended basic training in Miami Beach? Miami Beach, yes. Were you at a military installation or? At yes. What? Okay. We, uh, the, Ar the Army Air Force had taken over uh, a number of hotels there, mm -hmm. uh, to put the, the uh, recruits in, up in. And uh, the, the uh, the program there was essentially um, um, learning something about Army life mm -hmm. uh, with a major in close order drill. We did a lot of drilling, a lot of marching. Now, did you do a lot of that on the beach? We did it uh, on roads right next to the beach. I mean, we, we, where we marched, you could see the beach and the mm -hmm. ocean, but it was on the roads. All right. And what was your accommodations like? Did you have regular hotel well, they, rooms? Yes, they were very nice hotels. Of course, the hotel room that might have been built to accommodate a couple mm -hmm. uh, wound up with, I don't know now, maybe a half a dozen or more soldiers and all their equipment. So it, uh -huh. we didn't have the luxury that the, uh, the guests would have had before the war. But it was, it was very nice, probably the best of any I had while I was in the service. And how long was that basic training for? That ran... I think about 18 weeks. It may not have been quite that long. 18 I, weeks? Hard for me to remember. It may not have been. Maybe it was 12 weeks. I can't okay. remember. All right. Once you completed your basic training, where did they send you next? Okay. We, um, at, uh, at basic training, we took um, various tests uh, to determine uh, what schools we were going to be sent to. 
And uh, they ran all the way from Cooks and Baker School to radio school and so forth, which is where I went. Mm -hmm. um, I did well with the, uh, the Morse code test. And uh, so I was assigned to radio school, which was fine by me because radio had been a hobby of mine. And, uh, did you know Morse code uh, no, I didn't. prior to that? When, uh, when I was uh, younger, in my teens, a friend of mine and I had hooked a wire between our homes and were trying to teach ourselves code. Um, but it was a telegraph that operated with clicks. Uh -huh. And the, the code we used in, in the military was uh, use an oscillator so you had a tone, which is actually much easier to read than clicks. Uh -huh. uh, but I had been interested in radio and I did a great deal of uh, what now is called DXing, which is uh, long distance listening. My son does it and he could tell you more about that. In those days I don't think they even talked about DXing, but that's what I was doing. Uh, staying up late at night so I could pick up distance stations and that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, and you know, growing up in the 20s and 30s, uh, I had a, a great interest in flying. So that uh, going to radio school uh, with the hope of be becoming part of an air crew. Uh, had you ever been up in an airplane before? No, I hadn't. Um, when I was a kid, 12, 13 years old, I'd ride my bicycle from my home in Rock Center over to Roosevelt Field and distance of what, maybe 10 or 12 miles is mm -hmm. that far. Um, and walk up and down the flight line hoping maybe somebody would ask me if I'd like to go for a ride. Um, there were biplanes in those days. I, my, what I seem to, what stands out of my mind are these big red biplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody ever did invite me. Uh, so the first time I flew was in the Air Force, Army, mm -hmm. Army Air Force. Okay, now, how long was your radio school for? Well, that would have run about 18 weeks. Okay, and, and during that time, um, basically you knew that you were being trained or groomed to be a, an, an aircraft crew member? Not be necessarily, because some of the radio operators uh, would get assignments other than to air crews, but that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once you completed that training, what happened next? Uh, I was fortunate to finish toward the top of my class, uh, so that, um, uh, that those in my group were selected to go to a communications cadet school, uh, which uh, led to a commission. Oh. Uh, but before getting there, we had to put in a period of instructing at the same school that we just graduated from. Mm -hmm. So I became an instructor. Uh, that was kind of interesting because the students that were assigned to me uh, were about as good as I was. <laughs> and uh, I had to give them their radio code checks. And to pass a radio code check, you had to, the student had to be able to copy three minutes of code with no more than th three errors. Mm -hmm. But to give them the check, I had to copy it what we call solid, that is with no errors, otherwise how could I check them? Mm -hmm. So, and as I say, we were working on 20 words a minute at that time. It took 18 to graduate, and I, I was working on 25 when I graduated, uh, which is uh, really a little faster than you can copy with a pencil, which is the way we were doing. You really need to typewrite at 25 words a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, so I spent a great deal of my free time at school uh, practicing code. How long were you an instructor for? Um, from August until we shipped out on Thanksgiving Day, uh, November whatever that was, 1943. Okay, you shipped out to where? We went to uh, Communications Cadet School, which uh, that program had two um, uh, features or two sections, two parts to it. The first part uh, at Seymour Johnson Army Airfield in Goldsboro, North Carolina, uh, was what they called pre-technical school. Mm -hmm. It essentially was what was often referred to as 90-day wonder school, uh -huh. um, where you um, learned uh, Army life from an uh, officer's perspective. And uh, 
it was uh, it, it had a, a great deal of uh, uh, West Point uh, characteristics to it in that mm -hmm. we had upper classmen, lower classmen, we had hazing, uh, we had square meals, if you know what they are. Yep. Um, uh, we had uh, white glove inspections. It was very West Point like. Mm -hmm. uh, that some of the guys found that hard to take. Uh, I got through it okay. All right. In yeah. fact, I became a cadet lieutenant. Uh, so we finished there and were sent to the second phase of the training, which was at Yale University, mm -hmm. uh, which is about the same length of time, about three months. Uh, at that point, you, at the end of that, you would get a commission. Now, uh, what did you learn at Yale? In the second Yale was part. a technical school, and we had been told it would be pretty much of a repetition of what we had been through at Sioux Falls, mm -hmm. uh, which sounded great. I did find it at Sioux Falls, so I was pretty optimistic about Yale. That turned out not to be the case, though. Uh, militarily, I did fine. I became a, a cadet a squadron commander. Uh, but in, in the enlisted radio school, we learned to build uh, radio receivers and transmitters by reading schematics. Mm -hmm. The difference was at Yale, uh, we had to design the schematic. Uh, determine, they don't use these anymore, but uh, determine uh, the size uh, of resistors and capacitors or condensers as we call them then, uh, in the circuitry. And essentially, we had to design the circuitry that was used to create the schematic. That um, required a level of mathematics that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, in, in school I had taken a commercial course which lacked the higher mathematics and uh, I couldn't handle that. Mm -hmm. uh, they were reluctant to wash me out because of my cadet rank. It kind of demoralizing to have the commander washed out. It still hurts to think about. <laughs> but you know, on the third wash back, I told them they'd better wash me out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went back to what um, was called the GI Army and um, uh, was uh, given my former rank of corporal, which was quite a letdown when I'd expected to go to bars. Mm -hmm. So from there, um, there were a bunch of us um, eliminates that were shipped to gunnery school at Yuma, Arizona, and uh, where we got our aerial gunnery training. What was that like? It was very hot <laughs> because it was now July, August, September when I was out there, and uh, 110 is is an ordinary day in Yuma, Arizona, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that may very rough flying because of the thermals that are that rise off the, the desert. Uh, the high altitude gunnery was okay at 20,000 feet or more. Uh, you were above that, and we did quite a bit of flying up there, shooting at, at towed targets. Uh -huh. uh, some of it was low level gunnery, though, shooting at targets on the desert floor, and we bounced around pretty badly uh, when we were flying at low levels. Uh, but eventually, uh, you know, we, we got through that and they graduated. Uh, uh, I was assigned from that point to go to uh, Plant Park in Tampa, Florida for a crew assignment and uh, given a 10 day delay en route uh, to go from Yuma to Tampa, Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got to go home. That's the first time I've been home since I was inducted. And how long had that been? Well, that was from uh, January 1943 until uh, September uh, 1944. Okay, so you were away for quite a long quite period a long time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, we proceeded down to Tampa, and uh, Plant Park was had been a, a fairgrounds of some type, and uh, the army had taken it over and. Uh, the, our crew, all the crews were formed there, and that's where I met my crew. 
And uh, where, where were they from? All over the from all over the country. Yeah, they really were. Um, uh, the aircraft commander, the pilot, chief pilot, head pilot, was uh, from Pittsburgh. The co-pilot was from California. Uh, the navigator from Florida. Um, we had an armor of gunner, which is like an enlisted bombardier. They call them toddlers. Mm -hmm. uh, he was from Oklahoma. Uh, the uh, see the ball turret gunner uh, was was from uh, California. The uh, engineer top turret gunner was uh, Virginian. Um, the, the tail gunner was Maryland. And I was from New York. Mm -hmm. That's pretty eclectic. <laughs> yes. We got along fine. Now, did you uh, train quite a bit with them before being shipped overseas? Yeah, the, um, we were shipped from Plant Park uh, down the Hillsborough River to McDill Field. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now McDill Air Force Base. It's still a permanent um, Air Force installation. Uh, and we took our overseas training there. We flew us practice missions as a crew mm -hmm. until December. Uh, it was from September to December, the period of time we flew together as a crew. Now that was on a B-17? B-17s, right. That's what our gunnery training was in B-17s too. Okay. What was your impression of the B-17? I was glad I was on it. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't fast. Um, it could fly high. Um, it couldn't carry a particularly big bomb load, but it could take a lot of abuse. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we uh, we uh, flew up to. Can't remember whether we flew or were taken by train, but we got up to Hunter Field, which is in Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm and um, picked up a new B-17 that had 17 hours on it, and we were going to ferry that across. Um, we got another furlough at that point. It was early December, mid-December, and uh, we were given a five-day furlough, which wasn't a whole lot of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I, I hopped a ride on a C-47 headed north. It was going to Dover, Delaware, mm -hmm. and then on to Buffalo. I got off at Dover and took the train home to Long Island. Had an early Christmas, <coughs> early Christmas, and um, immediately uh, made a reservation on Eastern Airlines uh, for the for the trip back uh, on a uh, DC-3, which is a civilian C-47. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I'd been on a commercial airline, and I think I'm a bump to civilian. <laughs> okay, so. We got back, uh, reassembled it at Hunter, picked up the plane and headed out, and headed north. Uh, was overnighted in Dix Field, which today I think is McGuire Air Force Base, uh, and just overnighted there and then left there and went to Manchester, New Hampshire, which was our port of embarkation. Um, because of weather and some of the crew got sick, Cold, colds and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, we were delayed in getting out of Manchester, so we were there quite a while. In fact, we were there over Christmas. And uh, I guess right after that, uh, we took off and, and flew to, uh, next stop was uh, um, uh, Goose Bay, Labrador. Mm -hmm. And we were there a day or two, and uh, because it's winter now, I remember this. The snow was piled so high in Labrador, you know, they they would uh, clear paths with big derricks, and the snow was tremendously deep. Um, in fact, I think we landed on snow. The runway, I don't think, was clear down to the asphalt. We went from there to Meeksfield, which is in Keflavik, Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, so in those days, we didn't have the range to make it all the way across. Um, although I think those planes who went to Gander, Newfoundland, did go from from Gander directly across. They made the a one way, a one one stop trip. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way we went by New by way of um, Labrador, uh, it was a, a kind of a rock hopping thing. In fact, we flew over the tip of Greenland, 
um, in case we had to land there, but we didn't. And uh, landed at Meeksfield. We were there maybe four days, weathered in at Meeksfield yeah. in Iceland, and uh, then left there and um, landed at Valley Wales. Uh, what, what was the flight like over over the ocean? How long did that take, approximately? It took, uh, because of weather delays and some illness, uh, it took a long time. I would say we left uh, our port of embark embarkation, Burnett Field, in uh, Manchester um, sometime between Christmas and New Year's, mm -hmm. late December. Uh, and we got to Valley Wales in February. Wow. Yeah. We had a lot of delays. Uh, I think you have to understand that <clears throat> most of the crews on these planes, on, I'll talk about the pilots particularly because they're the ones that are most responsible for a safe flight. Uh, the rest of us are pretty much passengers, mm -hmm. except the navigator, he's a hard working guy. Um, but most of those pilots had only a few hundred hours of flight time. You know, they had their training and their transition to multi-engine and finally to the B-17, but if you put all those flight hours together, you're talking about a pilot with relatively low time, mm -hmm. not experience. Um, so the, they didn't want them uh, flying in extremely difficult weather conditions. Sure. The weather had to be satisfactory uh, where you took off and also where you were des destined to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of the reasons it, it took longer, because when we were in Iceland, uh, kept there by bad weather, I could hear the C-54s of the Air Transport Command coming and going. But those pilots were used to flying in that kind of weather. Mm -hmm. So at Valley Wales, um, we turned our plane over to the replacement depot, because we only ferried it. It wasn't, it wasn't going with us to the bomb group. And uh, we were assigned to the 305th Bomb Group in Chelveston, which is in Northamptonshire, about 50 miles north of London. Now, is that part of the 8th Air Force? Yes, it's, it was uh, 40th Bomb Wing, 1st uh, Division, 8th Air Force. Okay. And the 305th and its neighbor at Thurlay in England, um, were the two oldest bomb groups in, uh, in Europe. They had gone over in 42 or 1943. The 306 was commanded by uh, General Curtis mm -hmm. um who was then a colonel. Um, he was long gone by the time I joined the group late in the war, uh, but it was a famous bomb group. Now, how were you guys accepted as, as the new kids on the block? Well, um, because uh, tours of duty uh, were determined by the number of missions, the, the air crews were constantly turning over. Uh, so there, there really wasn't such a thing as a new kid on the block because there was a constant turnover of air, of air crews. The ground crews were permanent, mm -hmm. but they were used to this constant turnover of air crews as a crew finished its required number of missions they were uh, read, you know they were they were sent back to the states mm -hmm. um, so that that you know being new was not a problem everybody was new okay uh, what were your accommodations like uh, we lived in um, Neeson huts a typical um, British RAF type arrangements because this had been an RAF Field, but the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, Army Air Force had taken over many of the British bases. In fact, uh, England was almost one massive mm -hmm. air base. Uh, so they were, they were typical and uh, adequate because surprisingly, though, uh, the U.K. is um, far north of, of uh, say, New York, mm -hmm. uh, its climate is more mild. Not necessarily up in Scotland or the Hebrides, but down in, in Northamptonshire where I, we were based, uh, it was quite mild. In fact, when we landed in February in Valley Wales, it was like spring, the grass was green and the birds were chirping. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was not an uncomfortable uh, environment. And the uh, the Nisi huts were, were fine, they were very adequate. Now before you went on your first mission, your first bombing mission, 
Did you go on any training flights or missions? Yeah, we ran, um, for a week or two, we did the practice missions mm -hmm. uh, up over what they call the Wash, which is a very large bay, if that's the right name for it, um, up in the northern part of England on the North Sea. Okay. And we, did, we did practice missions up there. I can't remember exactly what we did. I'm sure uh, they must have had t uh, targets of some, some kind. Of course, the navigator got to do navigating and the pilot mm -hmm. got, got to do the flying and uh, the radio operators uh, would work ground stations and so forth. The gunners, I don't know whether they shot anything or not, but uh, we did uh, you know, a couple of weeks of that before we did our first real mission. Okay, now, uh, being assigned to that crew, you were a gunner and not a, not a radio operator. Okay, now the gunnery part. Uh, I was a pretty good radio operator, if I do say so. Mm -hmm. um, I was an adequate radio mechanic. That was the other part of radio school. Uh, I was uh, a passable gunner, but not great. Mm -hmm. uh, but fortunately for me, when we got overseas, we found that they had removed the radio hatch gun. So the radio operator didn't have a gun. I never fired in combat. <laughs> okay. So, so you were the B-17 radio operator? Radio operator. Okay. Uh, the reason I removed that gun, it wasn't terribly effective. A lot of these flexible or, or handheld machine guns weren't. Even the waste window uh, machine guns weren't all that effective. The turrets with their electric gun sights were much more effective and the top turret, which was operated by the engineer, covered the same field of fire as the radio hatch gun did with more accuracy than the radio hatch gun. So they just sealed up the hatch and took the gun out. So I never had to fire the gun, which is fine. I wasn't, I, w I preferred the radio to the gunnery. Okay. Well, uh, tell us about your first mission. What was that like and where, where was well, it? Well, you know, so, when, uh, you hear so much about it in training and so forth that uh, obviously when you go on your first mission, there's a lot of apprehension. Um, by this time of the war, the Luftwaffe was uh, not much of a factor. Um, there was still uh, very accurate uh, flak anti-aircraft from the ground. Mm -hmm. that, that was heavy and accurate. That continued right through the end of the war, but the Luftwaffe itself uh, was uh, not much of a factor any longer. And uh, on that first mission, we didn't see any enemy fighter planes. Um, Were you hit with flak, though? On the oh, yeah, we got hit with flak. Mm -hmm. um, our plane was never, the plane I was in was never knocked down. I saw planes that were Um, first mission was interesting in that we uh, went to a place called Swainamundi uh, on, the, on the Baltic coast and the, the purpose of the mission was to hinder the evacuation of, Ge of German troops uh, who were uh, being pushed back by the Russians advancing from the east and uh, by bombing the harbor installations, we, uh, we hope to interfere with their ability to evacuate their troops. Mm -hmm. um, my recollection is that uh, the 305th and maybe other groups that participated, I don't know, got some kind of a citation from the Soviet government. Do you recall how long that mission was? Well, my missions were all pretty long. I can, uh, do, you, do we have a minute? Oh, sure, sure. I happen to have my um, Air Force uh, Form 5A, which is a record of flying time here, they, they gave me this when I was discharged so I can look back and uh, I can see these, it's a separate sheet for each month. So I would be talking about the month of March, because that was March 12th on that first mission. If I can, uh, I can it's a little more for me to see the dates on this thing the way it's in here. Now, was that a high-altitude mission? Oh, yeah, they all were. Our typical missions were 30,000 feet. Okay. Now, uh, now, how did you keep warm? Well, there, there were um, heat vents that, that uh, took heat from the engines. Totally ineffective. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any heat came out of those things, but we wore electric heated, electric heated suits under our, uh, the rest of our 
you know, jackets and, uh -huh. and that sort of thing. Uh, what, was that adequate? Uh, the thing about the electric heated suit was that uh, the bottom of your legs against the seat of the chair and your back, if you were leaning back in the chair, I had a chair because I was a radio operator. The gunners, of course, had no chair, so they wouldn't have this problem. Uh, but the pilots and navigators and the radio operator would have this problem. It became very hot where the electric heated suit was pressed against your skin. Mm -hmm. But with an outside air temperature 30 degrees below zero, uh, the, the electric suit didn't do a lot for the rest of your body. So uh -huh. it was a peculiar feeling of being too hot on parts of your body and freezing in other parts. So. That, that was unusual. Okay. Uh, I should have, oh, here, this is June, and I'll have to get back to May and see. Now, did you normally fly the same airplane? Uh, I flew quite a, f a few in an airplane. The last three numbers of the uh, serial number were was 025. What, were any of the planes named at all? Did you yeah. fly? Uh, ours had a name that was given to it by a previous crew that flew it before. I, I, somewhere in my records I had that name, but I don't remember it. But I nicknamed it Wee Willy. Uh, we because uh, sarcastically, it's a big, a big airplane. But the, uh, there was a big W painted on the fuselage side of the airplane around the radio room window to identify it as uh, a, that particular plane within the 364th bomb group, which was identified with a, a smaller WF. Mm -hmm. And that part of, and part of the 305th bomb group, which was identified by a black triangle on the vertical stabilizer of the airplane with a big a white letter G in it and a green stripe. So you could tell the group, the squadron, and the particular plane. Okay. So um, W, the, the phonetic, for, for W is William, or was, it's mm -hmm. not now, it's whiskey now. But right. In those days it was William. Uh, and a lot of the rating walkers would say Willie, you know. Uh, now did, did you uh, decorate your flight jacket at all? At all? Yeah, I had a, a, <clears throat> a, a nice A2 jacket that the Army issued. Um, very similar to the one I have here, except this is goat skin, mm -hmm. and I, my recollection is that the issue jacket was a cowhide, okay. a sturdy jacket, and it, it was adorned with the uh, the group insignia and the squadron insignia. The sad part of that story is that, uh, and jumping ahead here now, but when I was discharged, we can't, went through Camp Kilmer uh, in New Jersey, where the quartermaster guys took certain um, items of equipment and uniform from us, and I lost my A2 jacket. Wow. And I had a nice Eisenhower jacket that I had tailored to fit. It was a particularly nice one. It was handed down from crew to crew based on seniority, and, I, uh -huh. and uh, they took that away too. And uh, reissued stuff that we actually had never worn in, in service. Mm -hmm. And that was just to get home in. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's the story of uh, Wee Willie. Okay. Now, <clears throat> after that first mission, once you re got back to base, what, uh, what happened next? Was there any kind of debriefing? Yes. Yeah, we had a debriefing. Um, the Red Cross women were there. I can't say girls. <laughs> they were too mature to be girls. Nice, nice ladies. Mm -hmm. um, and they uh, provided us with coffee and donuts. Uh, before we went into debriefing. Um, we always hear stories uh, where they gave you guys a shot of whiskey when well, you came I was down. just about to say, I think that was my recollection, is after the debriefing, uh, we could have a shot of whiskey, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't remember ever taking it. I, I was not a smoker, not a drinker. <laughs> what, what was the uh, debriefing like? Well, was I, it know, all I, the crews I together? Don't, I don't remember. Um, I really don't remember in detail too much about it, but I'll tell you about one debriefing. Um, we did a mission to Hamburg, Germany. Uh, where the heck was that? March 20th. 
1945. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, as, as gunnery uh, students, we had had a lot of aircraft recognition. And uh, we thought we knew every enemy aircraft there was. Uh, and on that mission, uh, we were attacked uh, by a plane we didn't recognize. Uh, it was very fast, mm -hmm. and uh, it would uh, fly through the formation. And uh, there were two of them that came through our particular formation. And they had 20 millimeter cannons. I don't know if we knew that at the time, but they hit some of, some of our planes, uh, but not critically. Mm -hmm. Didn't knock anybody down. Uh, a friend of mine was injured by flying plexiglass, uh, but that's the only injury I know of. Uh, and we had a P-51 escort, and the P-51 at the time was considered a pretty fast airplane, but he couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. uh, were those the uh, the German jets? They were, yeah, it was the ME-262, which was the first operation German jet, and we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. We found it out at debriefing. <laughs> That's the one debriefing I remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you, uh, well, you didn't lose any aircraft on that mission? No. Okay. I know there were uh, aircraft lost um, on missions at that time because I have records here that uh, um, my t late tail gunner's grandson developed, mm -hmm. got from governmental sources uh, that give casualty rates and that kind of thing. Uh, but. I never saw a plane that, I saw one that was shot down, not all the way down as it turned out, but it was going down in smoke. Uh, uh, they had a fire on the, on the flight deck, I found out later, and uh, I think they had one of the engines burning, and uh, I think the pilot was trying to put the fire out by diving. Mm -hmm. uh, so we saw them go down. Um, but they turned up at base later, so they were hit, but they weren't fatally hit. Do you want to tell us about that incident where you had a piece of flak come through your radio? Well, you know, there wasn't really an incident. We got um, a lot of that, just a, a small piece of flak, and I'll show it here. I put it on a chain. Uh, at the time, I thought I would give it to one of my sisters as a necklace to wear. Uh, you, you can't, it's just a little tiny piece of scrap metal. The pieces weren't all that size. Some of them were were larger. Okay. Um, this particular one, though, embedded itself in my radio set. And uh, so did your radio still function, or yeah, did it? It did. Yeah. Okay. And the tag here uh, quotes me as saying that this uh, yellow paint on this piece of flak that came off the radio, but. Here, 64 years later, that yellow paint has disappeared, mm -hmm. so it's not there. I doubt very much that my sister ever wore this thing. It's not exactly beautiful, but I assume there. Okay. Uh, now, did any of the crew on your aircraft ever receive any wounds? Do well. well. Did any of the crew members on any of your own personal missions, was anyone ever wounded at all? No. No. Um, as I say, in that one mission at Hamburg, uh, a friend of mine uh, who was a toggleer, mm -hmm. listed bombardier, uh, <clears throat> was injured by um, the plexiglass uh, when those ME-262s came through firing the 20 mm -hmm. millimeter cannon. One of them went through the, pl the, the plexiglass nose of his plane, and uh, some of that plexiglass embedded itself in his hand. Mm -hmm. That was not a uh, really a serious injury. That all those pieces had to be pulled out mm -hmm. when he got back. And uh, interesting because they uh, wanted to award him the Purple Heart, mm -hmm. and he felt it wasn't serious enough, mm -hmm. and so he declined it. Later, when the war was over, and they set up a point system for being returned to the states. And it was based on a number of factors. One, the number of months you'd been in service. 
and the number of months you've been overseas, um, points for awards that you receive, mm -hmm. uh, points for battle stars, that kind of thing. And uh, that Purple Heart would have given him five points. <laughs> <laughs> so he was uh, sorry at that point that he declined it. Uh -huh. now, now, how many missions did you fly all total? Only 17. Mm -hmm. The war ended. Uh, I've, my last mission, um, which is really uh, one of my two worst, uh, was to uh, Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. Um, the target was uh, the Škoda Armament Works. Um, but uh, Czechoslovakia was considered uh, enemy occupied, uh, not enemy not an enemy country, but mm -hmm. an occupied country. So uh, we were told to bomb the target only visually, no radar, um, to try to limit the collateral damage, as they now say. I don't think we had that expression then, but mm -hmm. um, to try to um, make the bombing as accurate as possible, we were to bomb only visually. When we got to the target, there was a cloud cover. Uh, so we proceeded to go around and come back again. We did that three times. Well, of course, but, and the, the flag was getting pretty heavy and pretty accurate by that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did manage to uh, get rid of the bombs. Hopefully they landed on the factory. Uh, the fact um, how, how yeah, many? In fact, I have a picture here of the factory showing, oh, okay. showing the damage. How many aircraft uh, were on that mission, roughly? You know, I have records here that my um, my uh, late tail gunner's grandson developed that it says exactly in all these missions tells tells how many planes. Interestingly, at the time I was flying, we knew these were thousand plane missions okay. we called them. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't realize until I saw these official records later was that all those thousand planes didn't go to the same target. There were often several targets. Mm -hmm. uh, so there weren't a thousand planes over one target. There could have been hundreds of planes, maybe three or four hundred planes. So I don't know exactly how many were on that particular mission. Okay. But uh, that surprised me because at the time I thought the whole thousand were going to one, to one target. Okay, where were you when you heard that the... Oh, first let me ask you, what was your reaction, if you recall, when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Uh, yes, the war was over at that time, and uh, we were still based in, uh, in Chelveston, England. Um, it was a shock. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, when the war ended, uh, what was it like? Was there a lot of celebrating? Or? Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember now whether we were warned. We, we had all been issued uh, Colt 45 automatic pistols. Um, and we could, we could uh, carry them on missions if we wanted to. My own feeling was that I didn't, I didn't think I could shoot my way out of Germany with a 45. <laughs> and it was heavy. It's a heavy weapon for mm -hmm. a handheld weapon. And accurate only at very close range, so I didn't carry it. I kept it locked in my foot locker. Uh -huh. um, but here's, uh, you know, ten men to a crew, nine or ten men to a crew, uh, all having Colt 45 pistols, and uh, the powers that be figured that there's going to be a lot, a lot of celebrating, you know, some of it not entirely sober. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't remember whether we had to turn our pistols in at that point or whether we were just warned not to, not to use them, but. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that there weren't there weren't some fired in the air. Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't join in those celebrations. I uh, uh, there was another one of course at VJ Day, which was pretty wild too. Mm -hmm. Now, were you still overseas when uh, Japan surrendered? Oh yeah. Uh, when after VE Day, uh, most of the heavy bomb groups and maybe other groups uh, in Europe were redeployed to the states. Mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, transitioned into B-29s uh, and, tr and shipped to the Pacific. Uh, two bomb groups were left in Europe, the 305th and the 306th. 
because they were the two oldest bond groups there. Mm -hmm. And they were assigned to the Casey Jones project. Here, here's another book. Oh, I think another radio operator that I knew was now deceased. Uh, something that tells about the Casey Jones project. Uh, Casey Jones uh, was to photo map uh, from 20,000 feet Europe and North Africa. Of course, now they can they can do that much better with satellites. But mm -hmm. uh, the maps they had, uh, they wanted better maps than were available at that time. So they used these two bond groups to photo map Europe or a great part of Europe and North mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, the 364th bomb squadron, mine, one of four squadrons in the 305th group, uh, was sent to Iceland at one point to photo map Iceland, which is, we were told our 12 planes could photo map Iceland in three days mm -hmm. in clear weather. Uh, three months later, I was sent back. <laughs> um, you, you don't say Iceland in clear weather in the same sentence. <laughs> uh, they don't get much clear weather in Iceland, so. Uh -huh. That was a project. Uh, incidentally, on that photo mapping project, my, my job was to turn the camera on and off. It was a, a Fairchild aerial camera mm -hmm. mounted in the floor of the radio room, which is how it became my job to turn it on and turn it off. Um, the navigator would tell me when to do that. Uh -huh. And it, it took uh, sequence pictures automatically. Uh, they overlapped by a lot. So it made a mosaic. And the, the Corps of Engineers took those photographs to convert them into maps. I see. So we did that. Uh, we were doing that until I came back to, to the States in January 46. And you were based right out of Iceland? Uh, we, we were based in Iceland. I was up there for uh, about three months. Mm -hmm. uh, what had happened was after, after VE Day, the, the group was moved to Europe. When you know the 305th and 306 were moved to the continent, mm -hmm. uh, when everybody else went back to the states, um, and um, we the 305th was at a place called Saint Trond in Belgium. Uh, the army called it A25. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a former Luftwaffe base, and um, so we did photo mapping of the continent from from there, and then we're. Uh, sent temporarily up to Beeks Field in Keflavik, Iceland to photo map Iceland. When I, when I was detached from the group and, and brought back to, to St. Trond, that Iceland project was still going on. Mm -hmm. So they hadn't finished it. I don't know if they ever did finish it. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I was given a, a, a one week furlough in the Riviera. So I was in Iceland one day and a couple of days later I was down in the Riviera. So I, in those days I was, uh, quite a dramatic change. What was it like traveling around Europe after the war had ended? Very, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I became a tourist, you know, and uh, um, my, my dad's family roots were uh, in Scotland. So um, I got up to Glasgow and Edinburgh, and I saw a lot of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of England too, you know, Shakespeare country and mm -hmm. Cambridge University, and you know, I traveled all over England, London, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I got to Paris. After, this was after VE Day, <clears throat> when we knew we were going to be moved to the continent. We needed uh, office equipment, and uh, we we took a C-47 over to. Uh, uh, an airport called Villa Coublet outside Paris um, to, to locate furniture that was being left behind by redeploy ground headquarters hmm. and uh, to, to use it ourselves. So I had an overnight in Paris the first time I'd been there. Took myself on a self-guided tour. I didn't speak French, but mm -hmm. I, I stopped at a newsstand and got a map of the city and just took myself by the hand and walked around. <coughs> walked around. Um, and of course the Riviera, and uh, actually I, I got to Schweinfurt too, and that was after the war we went to a number of places that had been bombed. Uh, Schweinfurt was a famous target, and mm -hmm. uh, 
had uh, resulted in, uh, in many losses of American aircraft. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the factory there uh, produced ball bearings, mm -hmm. which were essential to the, the, uh, the German manufacturing capability. And I can tell you that there wasn't a brick left except in, in, a, in rubble. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were was totally destroyed. I didn't, I didn't go into Schweinfurt right. I mean, that was earlier, 1943, I think, mm -hmm. when that happened. So we got to places like that. Okay. We did a, we did a low-level tour of the Ruhr Valley. Uh, destruction was unbelievable. It was not all Air Force destruction. A lot of it was artillery and, you know, general ground warfare. Mm -hmm. And the roar took a terrible beating. And we flew low level over that to see it. You know, because our missions were 30,000 feet, you really couldn't see much. Sure. So uh, that was enjoyable. Did you uh, get to see any USO shows at all while you were stationed overseas? I don't think we saw any USO shows, but the service clubs were operated by the U.S. So. Mm -hmm. How did you get along with the civilian population? Fine. Yeah. Did you find uh, any kind of shortages of food like in town or that if you wanted to go out and have a meal? When we were there the, um, the civilians had severe restrictions. Everything was rationed. Mm -hmm. um, we and the armed forces were pretty fortunate. Um, we weren't really denied much. Well, we didn't get real eggs much. We had powdered eggs. Mm -hmm. We didn't get much real milk. It was powdered milk. But uh, we ate well. And uh, of course, the civilians were getting by too. But uh, you know, eating was not a problem for us. In fact, the the mess hall personnel treated us like royalty. Okay. And uh, when did you eventually go home? Uh, <clears throat> uh, Jan early January, 1946. All right. And, and we didn't fly back, unfortunately. Uh, we were loaded onto 40 and 8 boxcars. Uh -huh. And um, it was about a three-day rail trip to Antwerp, Belgium. Uh, the army camp there was called Top Hat. And uh, we spent several days there and loaded on a cargo vessel called Fayetteville Victory, uh, which was a victory ship designed for cargo. Mm -hmm. It didn't have any cargo, it had troops, and it didn't ride very well in heavy seas, and uh, it was crossing the uh, North Atlantic in January as an experience in a cargo ship that isn't adequately ballasted. Uh, so it was a very rough trip. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate in that being uh, among top three grade enlisted men, I, I uh, was assigned a, uh, a cabin amidships. Uh -huh. And not luxury because there were 12 men in that cabin uh, in three tier bunks. But those of lesser rank were all pushed up in the bow of the ship to hold it down. Okay. We were nine days on that ship, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just bouncing all over the place. It must have been terrible up there. What was it like when you you pulled into uh, New York? We uh, arrived in New York uh, very early in the morning. It was, um, you know, I'll, I'll take that back. I think we arrived during the night and anchored offshore. <laughs> And we didn't proceed into the port until daybreak. Mm -hmm. But it was a gray, gloomy day, and uh, uh, we we could make out the Statue of Liberty. And uh, we uh, we docked in New Jersey, and, uh, and we're transported to Camp Kilmer, mm -hmm. which is somewhere in that vicinity. I don't think it exists anymore. And that's where we went through uh, the initial part of being discharged, where they took away parts of our 
uniform and reissued uniforms to us. And in that process, I lost my A2 jacket, which is my other flying jacket, and my Eisenhower jacket. Uh, we didn't make a big fuss about that because we didn't want anything to hold up our discharge. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop for a minute and change films. Okay, we're back. Um, we're talking about missions. You, you mentioned uh, one of the missions was how long? Well, that first mission, you had asked me before how long uh, that mission to Swain and Monday was where we bombed the um, harbor installations. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 10 hour and 5 minutes. Okay. These uh, missions at that stage of the war were long because they were deep into Germany. So while we didn't have um, anything like the casualties that uh, the mission suffered early in the war, Mm -hmm. uh, our missions were much longer. Okay. So in t time wise, my 17 missions probably were, could have been more hours than somebody who completed 25 missions in 1943 or so, you know, just time wise. Okay. Did you ever uh, have any missions that were scrubbed? I mean, you'd start off on a mission and due to weather or, or for one reason or another? I don't think we ever got another? a mission scrubbed once we became airborne. Uh, but what would happen uh, was that we would we would be called, typically, uh, out of bed at say 2:30 in the morning, mm -hmm. and driven by GI truck to the mess hall, and given breakfast, then driven to the briefing room for briefing, then driven to the equipment room to pick up our equipment, get out to the dispersal area, uh, load the barrels of the machine guns into the machine guns. Enlisted, the enlisted men had to do that, mm -hmm. the officers didn't. Um, and then we waited. Um, if we got, uh, the control tower wasn't using radio for obvious reasons because the enemy could pick up that and they'd know something was started. Mm -hmm. uh, so they used a, a very pistol from the control tower shooting f flares into the air and um, it would be a green flare for go and then you know we were all out there and it was all assigned who was going to taxi out first and mm -hmm. so forth um, if we got two red balls as we called it uh, the very pistol would fire up two red flares and call them red balls um, then the mission was scrubbed and that happened from time to time I was always very disappointed when that happened because uh, it was like the worst part of the mission was all of that preparatory uh -huh. work. Uh, it was almost a relief to get going. Mm -hmm. But I had a friend, another radio operator, in fact, that, the, the guy who sent me this Casey Jones thing, uh, who was always happy to see those two red flares. He figured the mission he didn't call on <laughs> was one he didn't have to worry about getting back from. Mm -hmm. um, his name was Albert, first name Albert, and I, every, you know, he was generally known as Al. And uh, I called him Red Red, because he was looking for those two red flares. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to me, I, I hated to see it, because now, uh, after having gone through all of that, it was probably, you know, maybe six o'clock in the morning by now. And we've been through all of that, and the whole thing is scrubbed, and we have to go through it again the next day. Mm -hmm. Now, the the day before your mission, did you know that you would be picked that night, or you'd be sound asleep, and somebody would tap you and say you're going? Yeah, they didn't tap you. The uh, CQ charge quarters uh, would come into the barracks and start shouting the names of people who were to fly that day. Mm -hmm. Then you knew you were going. Okay. Well, they didn't tell us the day before. It was pretty secret. Okay. All right. So uh, you completed your missions. You were sent back to the states. You were mentioning uh, before that you were turning your clothing in, your equipment. Some, some parts of it, yeah, not everything, but yeah, they did. They took. Why they did that, I don't know. 
Were you discharged at that point? No, or? that was Camp Kilmer, and then we were uh, sent down to Camp Fort Dix, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where I was discharged from Fort Dix. Um, I didn't want to delay the discharge uh, to sign up for the reserve. We had the opportunity to sign up and stay in the reserve. Got to tell you, in those days, uh, there was a strong feeling, uh, especially I think in the military, that. we'd be back at mm -hmm. war with the Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, I had friends who were shot down on, a, on a, uh, a raid to Berlin. And uh, we all wore American armbands, American flag armbands. Uh, and they were captured by the, Russia, <clears throat> by the Russians. And uh, in effect, interned. And this was when the war ended? It was close to the end of the war. And, mm -hmm. and after VE Day, they were repatriated, but um, they were treated like PWs. By the Russians. Yeah. We always felt that the Soviet Union was an ally of necessity. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is that expression? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh -huh. uh, but we didn't see them as friends. Okay. And so if I wanted to, I didn't want to have to, uh, if war started again, I didn't want to start at the, pot, <clears throat> at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I was a top three grade enlisted a technical sergeant. And uh, so I, I thought I'd stay in, <clears throat> stay in reserve. Well, I didn't want to do it at Fort Dix because I, w I wanted to get out, uh, but I did the next month. I went down to Whitehall Street in uh, Manhattan and joined the reserve. And I signed up, and uh, I got my tech sergeant rating back. Um, I was uh, assigned to the reserve, but I was working full time and going to college at night. And there really was no time for any reserve activity, so I never got active. In 1947, the following year, uh, the Air Force was separated from the Army, mm -hmm. became a separate branch, a separate arm. And uh, I was transferred from the Army Reserve to the Air Force Reserve and uh, commissioned. All right, let me, let me go back just a little bit. Uh, now, when you uh, came back to the States, were you with your crew? Did the whole crew come back together? Um, or were you separated? Separated. Okay. I had more points than some of my uh, fellow crew members because I flew, had flown more missions. Okay. There, there were times when I was flying almost every day, just for example, March 12th, March 14th, 15th, 19th, 20th, 22nd, 23rd. 24th, 28th, and 30th, in a period of just a little over a month, maybe six weeks, five or six weeks, I flew 17 missions. Uh, the reason I flew more than my crew was because I was sometimes uh, assigned to, to other crews mm -hmm. when my crew didn't fly. But they, they needed radio operators on other crews, sometimes in other squadrons of the group. So I was flying missions that they didn't. Okay. All right. And uh, once you were discharged, did you make use of the GI Bill? Yes, I did. I, uh, I had started college at night before the war, so I had 18 credits toward my degree, with 128 credits needed. Mm -hmm. uh, my employer paid part of that tuition at that time, and I paid the rest. Who did you go to work for? I was working for a, a bank in New York City, which was one of the major banks at that time, no longer exists, called Irving Trust Company at One Wall Street. And uh, I went to NYU, which had a downtown campus, a business school, mm -hmm. uh, on Trinity Place within two blocks of the bank. So I'd get out of work at 5 o'clock, and I think classes started at 5.30 or 5.45, and I had a chance to stop at the automat and get something to eat, and then I went to classes. Um, and I had 18 credits before I went in the service, mm -hmm. and um, 
after I was discharged, I went back to work immediately for the bank and, uh, and signed up for the school. Uh, the, fall, the fall session, right? See, I got out in January. I went right back to work for the bank and joined the reserve. Uh, I didn't go start back at college until September. Okay. What did you get your degree in? Uh, it's a Bachelor of Science degree in business. Banking. Okay. In banking. Okay. Now you mentioned uh, joining the Air Force Reserve, or joining the Army Reserve, then they became the Air Force, right. and you were given uh, a commission? Uh, yes, I was discharged from the Army Reserve and commissioned in the Air Force Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, they had a program where a top three grade enlisted men could apply for a commission, and you were given a test. It essentially, as I remember, was pretty much like that Army General Classification test they took when I was inducted into the Army, mm -hmm. a very similar kind of test. And uh, they um, assigned me as a communications officer, which is what I would have been if I had graduated at Yale. Mm -hmm. So, but they didn't have any communications reserve units uh, operative. So they assigned me to a reserve unit of pilots. And I did attend some of those meetings, uh, but uh, what they were studying and working on had nothing to do with my MOS, my military uh -huh. occupational specialty. Um, and I was extremely busy working full time at the bank and going to college at night and studying in my spare time. I just didn't, I couldn't fit active reserve into that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of my five year term as a commissioned officer, I resigned. Now, were you a second or first lieutenant when you were second? I had started taking a program that was called, uh, I think at that point it was called the Series 20. Uh, there were probably other series for higher grades, but to be promoted from uh, second lieutenant to first lieutenant, uh, you could take this course called the Series 20 course. It was a correspondence course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing that in addition to my homework at college. And, you know, I. I, 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 would, I did uh, do that, but of course that all went down the drain when I resigned. Uh -huh. It was just too much to do all that at one time. I finally got my degree in 1951. Okay. And you didn't get uh, called up for Korea? I had two invitations, <laughs> and I was pretty sure the third one was going to be in order. Uh -huh. um, it never came through. You say uh, invitations. What were they? Uh, I think I have that communication somewhere in my records, but essentially what it said, we are in dire need of communications officers. Uh, uh, would you consider becoming activated or words to that effect? Mm -hmm. Military lingo, and I don't remember exactly how, uh -huh. but it was obviously they were asking me to become active. They were looking for volunteers. Uh, well, they, I was already in the reserve, not oh, the volunteer, okay. but to, to uh, yeah, to be to become activated. Okay. Um, that was a tough time for me. I uh, had gotten married. Uh, we had uh, signed a contract to buy a house. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had my civilian career going. Mm -hmm. uh, it would not have been a good time for me, <laughs> which didn't always make any difference. I had a friend who was a PFC in the Army. He had been in the infantry during World War II. He stayed in the reserve and he, he went into the armored division because he had always been interested in tanks. Mm -hmm. And he was a PFC in the armored reserve. And when the Korean War broke out, he was ordered up. This poor guy had about five children. <laughs> And it was, you know, how he was going to make it on the PFC pay, impossible. Mm -hmm. So he tried everything he knew to get, to get out of going, but he was essential. He must have been the most essential PFC in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he was sent to the Pacific. Uh, he didn't go to Korea. He was put in charge of a, of a gun room on one of the islands that had been taken by the Americans during the war with Japan. And his, his job there was to issue uh, rifles to civilian guards in the morning and to take them back in at night 
that was the essential job. Uh, so, I mean, um, your, the necessity of your, of your civilian life didn't always count. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just lucky, I guess, that I, I didn't get called up. Okay. Did you uh, join any uh, veterans groups? Never. Okay. Did you stay in contact with anyone you were in service with? Yes. Uh, they're all gone now. You're the last one from your crew? Uh, that's not quite right, is it? Uh, no, because there's two of us left on my crew. The, as far as I know, the navigator was not in good shape. He's in mm -hmm. a nursing home. Uh, I, I do uh, communicate with his wife uh, once or twice a year, at uh -huh. Christmas time and sometimes in between. Sure. Um, He's a couple of years older than I am, which was, he's pushing 90. Uh, so uh, he and I are the only ones left. And as I say, I'm not even sure about him. I think if he had died, his wife would have written me. So assume, I'm assuming he's still extant, but uh, mm -hmm. the rest of the crew is gone. And many of my friends were from other crews. And I, uh, uh, some of them from the, my cadet days. And uh, we, st we stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. They're all gone. Okay. How do you think your time in the service uh, changed or affected your life? Uh, totally for the positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had a friend say that uh, uh, he wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't take a million dollars to do it again. <laughs> we hear a lot of veterans say that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, I was very fortunate. I, I, uh, you hear so many uh, guys saying that they were misassigned. You know, they, they, a civilian career and experience with the one thing in the army put them in something else, and that wasn't true with me. I mean, uh, my uh, military experience was good. Okay. You brought along some memorabilia. Do you want to show I, us those? I don't know if it's it's possible really uh, to show you. I think I showed you the this thing on Casey Jones. It it talks about the um, the photo mapping project. Uh, th this book here uh, is something that uh, th these are official Army Air Force records that um, my uh, tail gunner's grandson got from. Uh, governmental units, and the, many of them are, and I'll just show you a page here, are photocopies, that's not photocopies, photostats, very hard to read, uh, but uh, this book okay. has the official records of all the missions I was on. Okay. Uh, this one here, I put together for my uh, 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 tail gunner's grandson, and it tells the story of uh, our particular crew, the book is called Kurt's Crew, uh, because Michael Curtis, who we all call Kurt, was the pilot. And crews were usually identified by their pilot's name. And uh, this, is, this book is full of pictures and so forth of, uh, uh, of our group at that, of our crew at that time. Do you have a picture of yourself? Oh yeah, a lot of pictures of me. There's probably more of me than anybody else because it's my book. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Do you want to show us one of them there's, so there's, we can see what you look one like? In my, in my A2 jacket that I lost. C can you hold that up in oh, front of you? So can you can you bring it back farther? Oh, f back further. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, get, I can zoom right in on it. This picture here was was taken in Iceland, and it's my uh, the largest waterfall in Iceland, which they call Gulf Foss which in Icelandic means Golden Falls. It's there, Niagara Falls. And it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. um, you can't see very well, but these, this page here shows the wreck of our uh, B-17. We were uh, heading to Iceland for photo mapping. And our engineer was taxiing the plane from one point to another. This was in Presswick, Scotland. Uh -huh. And the brakes gave out while he was taxiing it. He lost control of the plane and it rammed into a, uh, I don't know, brick stucco 
mm -hmm. building that uh, was used as a firehouse and uh, ripped off the wing on the plane. Wow. <laughs> so um, we, had, <coughs> we had to get another thing to continue on to Iceland, but uh, well, let's see if any other pictures. Uh, got two pictures of my crew here. I don't know if we can. One of them is the official picture. This was taken in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, oh, okay, can you back again? just bring it back if you would? Okay, and whereabouts are you in the picture? Well, uh, I, I have to get over here to see. Uh, there I am, right there. This is this was a hitchhiker. He's a radar bombardier that hitched a ride with us to get to Europe. He was not part of our crew. Okay. Robo Banowski. This is Michael Curtis, our pilot. Okay. Bob Nostein, our co-pilot. Robbie Robertson, who's the only other crew member still alive, who was our navigator. This is Bob Seville, our engineer, Jack Morgan, our tail gunner, uh, Chuck Dillo, our waste gunner. Uh, I'm, I'm here, the radio operator. This is Leo Romero, the bolt hard gunner, and Tommy Landreth, the toggleer. Okay. Uh, toggleer, I don't know whether you've heard that expression before. Yes. You have. Um, a toggleer is an armor gunner, and uh, at this stage of the war, they would, would put a a commissioned bombardier only in the lead, lead plane mm -hmm. of each element. And an armor gunner would be in the bombardier's position in, on the following planes, but without the bomb site, without the Norden bomb site, which was still classified. Sure. And the toggleer, enlisted toggleer, would watch the lead plane, and when the bomb bay doors opened, he'd toggle the switch to open the bomb bay doors. When he saw the bomb salvo, he'd, he'd to hit the toggle switch to salvo his bomb, so they got a good pattern that way. But that's why they call them toggleers, because they, they mm -hmm. toggle the bombs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. And uh, <clears throat> you also have some medals that uh, look pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, Do you want to tell us uh, the story about uh, who you got them from? Uh, yes. Um, when the group was, after the, after VE the Day, uh, and after we had been in Belgium for a while, and we had finished the or at least I had finished the Iceland part, the group was moved down to Lechfeld uh, in uh, Bavaria, Germany. And uh, we were quartered in a former Luftwaffe base that had been used for testing the uh, ME-262 Messerschmitt uh, jet fighter plane, mm -hmm. the first operational jet fighter that Germany had, that anybody had. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had, um, I guess, former POWs that, who were doing housework for us, janitorial work in the barracks. The barracks were, uh, had been used, of course, by um, the German Air Force, um, and now we were using them. And uh, one, of, one of these uh, men uh, told me that he had been a fighter pilot in the German Air Force, and he had some medals. Um, this is not the one I wanted to show you right off the bat, but uh, it's this one here. And he agreed to sell them to me uh, in exchange for cigarettes, which was, uh, cigarettes were being used like currency in those days. And he gave, I bought that way, using cigarettes, his, what he said was his Iron Cross. It's marked, it has a swastika in the middle of the Maltese Cross, and it's marked 1939. And he claimed to have been awarded this Iron Cross for having shot down aircraft, uh -huh. which he hastened to tell me were British, not American. Uh -huh. But of course, in 1939, they would have had to been because we weren't flying over there in those days. So that was that was kind of interesting. And I, he he sold me some other medals. Here's a rather attractive one, um, which shows the Maltese cross again with the swastika in the middle, and the back of it says, in German, for faithful service. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told that this meant um, um, 25 years of service uh, in the Nazi party because the box it came in is, has a 25 on it. Uh -huh. But there's a question about that because we don't know if 
the National Socialist Party, Nazis, existed 25 years before this medal mm -hmm. was awarded. So there may be some doubt about what it was issued for, but uh, okay. it, in any way, it's a pretty medal. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a, a combat infantry badge here, which is not very pretty. It looks like it's made out of lead. And you mentioned that your father typed the information? Yeah, he did. Um, he describes it. Um, he said it's worn on the left breast pocket of a blouse immediately beneath the Iron Cross or any other decoration. It says, it goes on to say, it may have been given to soldiers who have taken part in at least three attacks on the enemy position on three different days and have overcome the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay. Uh, I think the Germans didn't have good metal to make their, <laughs> to make their metals out of them. That's not particularly attractive. But. Yeah. Anyway, you know... Now, do you want to show us your gunner wings that you have? Oh, yeah. I have two, two wings here. Uh, when I graduated from gunnery school, uh, these are the wings that we were given. And it shows, it's, uh, it looks like a lot like a bombardier's wing. It, 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 it's supposed to be a bullet with wings dropping straight down. The bombardier wing was very much like that, except the bomb had fins on it. Okay. And uh, it was longer and narrower than that bullet. Uh, I didn't like to wear this because I didn't really regard myself as a gunner. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have a gun when I got overseas. So what I wore was something called crew member wings. These wings can be worn by anybody who's part of a crew. Okay. I mean, the pilots obviously would want to wear their wings and the other crew, you know. But I felt as a radio operator, my MOS was radio operator gunner. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't, how could I be a gunner? I had no gun. So uh, I preferred this one because uh, it didn't indicate that I was a gunner. And you also received uh, some air medals? Well, yeah, we, uh, let's see, where's the top of this one? Um, yeah, the only medal outside of theater ribbons, and victory ribbon, good conduct ribbon, things like that I got was the air medal. Uh, this was awarded uh, for each six missions. Uh, that's the air medal. Uh, I was awarded this twice, so they don't give me the medal two times. The second time you get a bronze star. Okay. And the bronze star is is put on the ribbon. You don't wear the medal either on your uniform. You wear the ribbon and the bronze, not bronze star, bron uh, oak leaf cluster. cluster. I'm sorry, oak, right. oak leaf cluster goes on the ribbon. So I have the air medal with an oak leaf cluster. Uh, that would have that would have been for the first twelve missions. I didn't get the third one because I missed it by one mission. I, I flew 17 missions. <laughs> but uh, I didn't care that much about the medal, but I, uh, I was really uh, trying to set a record for the shortest uh, overseas time anybody ever set. The way I was flying so much, uh, I would have been home within three months. Mm -hmm. I would have completed my tour and been home probably in less than three months. I didn't know anybody who had done that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Well, thank you. I'm just happy to be here.